Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so this is a joint work with my colleagues uh, at CISPA, Salon University, and MPI, uh, Michael Bacchus, uh, Pascal Barong, and Praveen uh, Manoram. So before diving into the contribution of this work, let me give you a bit of context. So we are um, currently facing a real deluge of biomedical data that is made possible by the quickly decreasing cost of uh, molecular profiling. The best example of this uh, phenomenon is the, the cost of whole genome sequencing, which has dropped to, uh, to around $1,000 uh, in 2015. As a consequence, this enables uh, the, the new precision medicine revolution that is best exemplified by the precision medicine initiative launched by President Obama uh, last year. There are also uh, a new uh, internal consortium like uh, global, the Global Alliance for, for Genomic and Health, and there are also big players entering the game, such as Google. So this leads to an increasing amount of biomedical data available, not only on uh, trusted databases such as, um, such as hospital servers, but also on third-party providers, uh, private companies such as uh, 23andMe, uh, that has reached more than one million customers uh, recently. There, there are also more and more people sharing, openly sharing their genomic data online on platforms such as OpenSNP. And actually, the, the genomic data are not the only types of biomedical data that is now available online. There is also this uh, database uh, called Gene Expression Omnibus that contains now more than one million samples of, of different kinds of biomedical data, such as, uh, well, gene expression, but also epigenetic data, microRNAs, and so on and so forth. So we clearly see uh, that the Hippocratic Oath that has protected our uh, medical and health privacy uh, for, for thousands of years is a bit outdated. It's still, of course, a, a moral commitment, uh, a necessary mo moral commitment between a patient and his practitioner, but it's definitely not sufficient to protect health privacy uh, in the digital age. And the extent of this threat has been extensively uh, uh, demonstrated for genomic privacy. Uh, since uh, the very first paper, the very first attack back in 2008 by Homer, Homer et al. And we see here, I encourage you to read this uh, really nice review by uh, Herlish and Narayan on routes for breaching and, and protecting genetic privacy. And we see here even a categorization of the different kinds of attacks against genomic data. The bad thing is that it's, it's, it, it doesn't really uh, um, co consider uh, any type of other biomedical data. However, uh, the human body actually uh, needs more than the, the genome layer to work properly, right? There are uh, all kinds of different, uh, different elements that is needed uh, to, to, to be healthy, right? There is this uh, transcriptome layer, the proteome layer, up to the phenome layer that, that uh, conveys the, our physical threats and potentially our, our diseases. So the genome, in a sense, is just a physical layer of the human Aussie stack. So what we, are, uh, we will focus on in this talk is uh, microRNA expression, which is on the, on the transcriptome, uh, transcriptome layers. So it's an epigenetic mechanism that, that notably influences uh, gene expression that itself influences cancer. So we know that cancer is mostly influenced by, the envi by our environment and not by our genes. So that's why uh, biomedical researchers are, are so much interested into this microRNA expression, because they could be used, as, in a sense, as a proxy uh, to detect or to early, earlier diagnose uh, some, some cancers. And actually, uh, it has already been shown by, uh, by uh, many studies um, that there was some association between microRNAs uh, expression, so dysregulation of these expressions, and many severe uh, diseases such as Alzheimer, heart disease, diabetes, and so on and so forth. So we see that microRNA expressions are very sensitive data, but the problem is that on the privacy side, that this, the, the risk stemming from this data have been largely overlooked so far. So in this work, we're gonna uh, study a uh, uh, very popular uh, attack in this field, and actually, uh, as we, we have seen in the previous talk, also in, in, for all kinds of, of data, the membership inference attack. And this was one of the very first attacks, actually, against genomic data by Omer et al. in 2008, that were using only summary statistics uh, to infer membership in a data set. And since then, there's been a lot of uh, follow-up work, 
on clarifying the theoretical bounds of the attack and on providing meaningful protection mechanisms. So the research questions of this work are as follows. First of all, we are going to study whether microRNA expressions data set are also prone to membership inference under also which con theoretical and empirical conditions. And if yes, if there is any uh, efficient defense mechanism that provides at the same time protection against membership inference and statistical utility. And we we'll study in particular uh, two, two methods, one that consists in just masking a subset of microRNA and the other that is uh, relying on the more traditional differential privacy uh, approach. So you can already guess uh, from two that one is uh, probably, the answer is yes, right? So let me uh, now present the system threat models. So we have a microRNA uh, database, a pool T of M microRNA expression for uh, N individuals. So microRNA expression are, are in R, are real values. And then uh, some, some analyst actually queries the databases and queries uh, summary statistics, such as in particular in this work, we're going to study the mean statistics. And the curious analyst also has access to the actual value of his victim, XV. And so by combining these two uh, information, by comparing these, uh, he wants to, she wants to determine if V is member of the pool of this uh, database T uh, or not. So you're going to ask what are then the differences with the, all the, the work on genomic privacy? Well, they are twofold. First of all, a microRNA expression consists of uh, real vectors, whereas genomic variants are, are just binary or ternary values. Oops, sorry. Uh, moreover, uh, Moreover, uh, the second difference is that, the, well, anyway, the dimensionality of, of uh, um, microRNA expression is much smaller than on genomic variants. So genomic variants are in the order of tens of millions of variants, whereas microRNAs, uh, there are currently 5,000 known microRNAs. So for the attack, we're going to use uh, two different approaches, statistical tests. One that is uh, borrowed from Homer et al. idea, which, uh, which is based on the L1 distance differences. So basically, if we, get the, if we know the real value of the victim, X, so we, we, comp we can compute the difference with the mean expression in the reference population and uh, the difference with the mean expression in the pool. So we see from this equation that this should tend to zero if V is not in the pool, because then mu hat will be very close to mu. And this will be uh, certainly greater if V is in the pool. So by summing over all microRNA J, if, if the number of microRNA is big, big enough, then this should converge to a normal uh, distribution that allows us to uh, make use of a statistical t-test to, uh, to infer whether V is part of the pool or not. Uh, the main drawback of this first approach is that it doesn't give any theoretical guarantee on the, on the power uh, of the attack given a false positive level, whereas the likelihood ratio test uh, is actually, actually does. So for, uh, for a given false positive level, we can achieve the maximum, uh, the maximum true positive rate due to the, and this is uh, due to the Neyman, Neyman person lemma. This has also been shown to outperform the, the first approach in practice with, with genomic data back in 2009. So here is the first, uh, the main uh, results, analytical results of our attack, uh, which is also another advantage of, of the second approach, is that it, it gives us the relation between the power, the false positive rate, um, here it's, a, it's, it's percentile of the standard normal distribution, uh, the false positive rate, the number of exposed microRNA statistics M, and the number of individuals in the pool. So the take home high level message that you, you can you should remember is that for a successful attack here, the number of exposed microRNA statistics has to scale with the square of the people, the number of people in the pool. Uh, whereas in the case of the genomic uh, data, it only had to increase linearly with n. So from a privacy point of view, uh, this is good news, right? MicroRNA expression are somehow uh, less prone to membership inference attack than genomic variants. So now let's check uh, in practice with, with real data if it still holds. So in order to do so, we, we made use of a, a relatively rich data set because uh, there are currently not so many microRNA expression uh, data sets uh, available. 
containing more than 1,000 individuals, among which 955 uh, carry at least one out of 19 severe diseases, from 124 individuals carrying Wills tumor to only 13 carrying a tom stomach tumor. We made use, uh, we, we, we approximated the reference population statistics uh, by using the whole, the whole 1,049 individuals in the data set. So every individual also uh, contain 148 uh, microRNA expression. And as this is quite standard in the biomedical uh, research community, we'll filter out uh, the non-expressed microRNA, so the microRNA is with median expression level smaller than, than 50. So this led, this led us to uh, 466 expressed microRNA. Uh, note that the data set is uh, publicly available online now on the geo, uh, on the geo database, in the geo database. So to verify our, uh, our analytical result, the, the previously shown theorem, we uh, designed two different settings, experimental settings. First, we generated the pool by randomly picking individuals among, any individuals among the, the full set of individuals. And the second is we focus on DC specific pool, which is perhaps a more realistic scenario because currently bi well, biomedical researchers make make use of uh, this, this uh, case group, let's say. And here we use the 19 different diseases that we have, that we know. So first, let me show you the, the results for a for small, uh, small size pool of 35 individuals. So this is the case with a random selection of individuals. You see on the x-axis the false positive rate. And this is a logarithmic scale. And on the y-axis, the true positive weight, the power of the adversary. So we see, we first noticed that the likelihood ratio outperforms the L1 distance, both, uh, well, empirically. It also outperforms the LR uh, theor theoretical uh, curve. Now, if we, uh, if we set the false positive rate to 10%, for instance, um, the adversary reaches a power of 40%. Now, if we uh, focus on uh, the same size, on another pool of the same size, but uh, of only patient, containing only patient with the same disease, uh, we see that the results change quite a lot. And actually, uh, in this case, the, the power adversary for the same level of, of privacy, for the same level of false positive rate actually decreases. And this is uh, uh, one of the very few exceptions where uh, the results, the power, uh, decreases from the, from the random pool to the, to the case group. So let me now show you uh, an example with a bit more individuals, 124 individuals in the pool. We see that uh, with the random pool, well, uh, quite uh, logically, the results actually decreases to around 25% power for 10% false positive. And now if we pick the same size, the same pool with the same number of, well, a different pool with uh, only patients carrying the Wills tumor with the same uh, number of individuals, we see uh, a quite big, immense uh, gap in the, in the success of the, of the attack. So now we see that we reach uh, um, a true positive rate of 60%. So this shows that we have to, to somehow be very careful when we deal with, with case groups. And, and that we have to somehow, uh, you know, uh, propose uh, countermeasures to, to deal with this. So we have uh, studied, as I said, uh, two different protection mechanisms, one that relies on just masking uh, some microRNA expression statistics, so we release only from one to uh, the whole set of microRNAs. And the other, which is more uh, standard in the community now, is to, is to add noise in a differentially private manner. So uh, we added noise using, uh, we ger generated the noise using the Laplace distribution, uh, which is quite suitable for the, for the main, mean statistic. And so with a scale that is equal to the sensitivity divide of the function of the average function divided by epsilon. So now the sensitivity function in this case is the sum over all microRNA i of the range of their expressions, right? For any, actually, uh, microRNA. So it means that the amount of noise also will, will scale proportionally uh, to this, uh, the sum of the ranges of the microRNA expression. The problem in our, with this data 
is that for some of the microRNAs, the range is really big. It's more than 10,000. Whereas for the majority of them, the mean, the mean statistic is uh, smaller than 200. So, so in a sense, the noise will affect similarly all, all microRNAs uh, statistics. Uh, but I mean, for some of them, it will be way uh, too large, actually. So uh, what we, uh, we, we wanted also to, to try to reduce uh, this, this noise. So we, we studied a relaxed uh, model for the adversary. So we consider an adversary only uh, with bounded priors on the membership, the prior uh, membership probabilities, right? Uh, this is called positive membership privacy, and this was presented here at TCS in 2014. And so here we consider the prior as being the prevalence rate of the disease in a given country. And here we set A to B, so we really narrow down the, the prior to a single value. So for instance, for the US, if the adversary knows all pa patients in the database are in the US, the prevalence rate for prostate cancer, for instance, 0 0.009. So then from, from, from these values and, and from gamma, the privacy parameter of this, of this uh, scheme, we can derive the appropriate epsilon. And we see that the epsilon uh, increases much faster than the gamma, so, so in a sense the noise also is, is normally uh, reduced, right? And, and this is due to the, to the paper of Trammer et al. Uh, presented last year at CCS. So now let's look at some, uh, some examples. So let's look at the noise, the distribution, the probability that the noise increased certain value x. And here we have, we have uh, plotted, in fact, uh, six different curves. So we can barely see the difference between, between some pairs, right? Well, these pairs represent the, the bounded, the case with the bounded adversary, so weaker adversary, and the unbounded, un unbounded adversary, which is assumed in traditional uh, epsilon differential privacy. So we see that with, with, our, uh, with our data, the difference is not, is not significant at all, so we don't, we don't gain so much in, in relaxing the, uh, the adversarial uh, model. So what we did is, in the end, we, we considered the, the, the strongest adversary, and, and we evaluated the, the, the results and how it affects uh, the, the success of the attack. So here we show the, the evolution of the AUC, so AUC with increased noise from, from epsilon equals 10,000 to one, and the AUC is just the area under the curve that we have seen uh, previously, right? So one means that there is no privacy, the attacker has full power at any false positive rate, right? And 0 0.5 means best privacy. So what do we see? First, uh, that the likelihood ratio with uh, really low noise performs better than the L1 distance as expected. But then we see also that uh, L1 distance is more robust than uh, the likelihood ratio uh, test uh, with an increased number of noise. So we have, this is quite surprising and we have to be very careful uh, with this. Now we also uh, evaluated the, the evolution of, of utility with increased uh, amount of noise. Uh, and we measure this as a noise to mean ratio. And so we, f we see that if we want really a almost perfect privacy, uh, um, we have to pick epsilon equals to 10 in this case, and we, we can reach uh, a utility that is just, that adds in, on average 10% of noise to the mean statistics. <coughs> now we also studied the, our uh, hiding mechanisms with the same, with the same pool of uh, patients. And here we see first that the, the attack, the attack is very robust to a decreasing number of microRNAs. And we also see that the privacy, the success never reaches 0 0.5. The AUC never reaches uh, 0 0.5. So this is perhaps not the best, uh, the best method to, uh, to ensure uh, privacy in this case. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we have uh, shown in this work that microRNA-based studies are indeed prone to membership inference. However, the dimension M of the number of release microRNA uh, statistics has to scale with the square of the number of n of individuals in the pool. Also, m is much smaller in the case of microRNA expression than in the case of genomic databases. So both these points are kind of good for privacy, right? The problem is that, on the contrary, n is also quite small in the current microRNA expression databases because we don't have as many microRNA uh, data than, uh, than genomic data. 
And also, microRNA uh, expressions are way more affected by, the, by your health status than, uh, than our genotype. Our genotype, for instance, uh, our genomic variants, there are only a few of them out of millions uh, correlate, correlating with some, some diseases, whereas the microRNA expression can vary uh, way more. So the high-level recommendation here uh, is to increase at least N to more than uh, 200, so number of, of people in the, in the pool, in order to ensure both privacy and statistical significance of the, of the studies, right? And if really the, the considered disease influences a lot the microRNA expression statistics, then we, we recommend to add a bit of noise. So among uh, interesting, promising future directions, uh, it would be good to uh, study uh, theoretical bounds with noisy statistics, also evaluate the impact of, of the correlated microRNAs, and finally uh, uh, making use of microRNA expression data collected at, uh, at different uh, points in, in time. So thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Questions? Hi, I'm Carl Gunter from the University of Illinois. Thanks for the talk. Hi. Um, I'm wanting to try to understand a little better how you're using utility. So that I can think of two senses for the use of the term, and I, I think the first one was its effectiveness against the attacks, so whether the attacks are defeated you know, with the measures. Another sense of utility would be the, uh, um, some measure of how much you've damaged or changed the data by doing the privacy transformations. Is it the case you, you had a lot of charts? So I, 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 is, is it true that you had some things on the second category or no? I did, yeah, I did. Uh, okay. Well. So, so this would be measures of how well you've kept the quality of the data for the analyst. Yeah, so the red, the red curve here, I guess, um, shows this, uh, how, how the noise affects the quality of, of the data, right? So it, how it changes, how it perturbates, how much it perturbates the original uh, statistics, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we see on the y-axis on the right, uh, the, the ratio between the noise and the original statistic, the mean, original mean values. Okay, that's the right. specific case of the prostate cancer. Yeah, but we could apply this to any, any sorts of data sets, right? Okay, so basically you could take examples of these things and yeah. show how well it does on them. Yeah, yeah. We don't have any uh, generic uh, universal bound, let's say. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so in this figure, so when you draw this line here, it's 10 to the 1, so this means it's used to 10, right? Where? In this figure. Yeah. In this, so here. The, the utility, you mean? No, but the, the axis is epsilon, right? The epsilon goes to 1, up to 1, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. the line here basically shows that when you have epsilon equals 10, you have the uh, utility in uh, 10 to the 1, so 0 0.1 10, here. 10 minus 1, yeah. But so on the other hand, uh, the raw curve can be very bad, right? I think for the green one, you know, that the, the better, the, uh, the higher, the better, right? So I'm just saying that 10 seems to be pretty high privacy budget for differential privacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you give reasonable, uh, like uh, 5, 3, 1, uh, to epsilon, would that mean that you could destroy a lot of uh, utility? If we set epsilon to one? Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. You see that the utility actually, the, the loss in utility actually explodes uh, when we get closer to, uh, to one, right? And so then utility, the noise to be added is 10 times the, the, the average mean value. So it's definitely not affordable. So is the message then saying that if I need relative good privacy, say I set epsilon to one or two, then that means you basically yeah. lose all the utility if you want. Yeah, for this n, for this value of n, of course, yeah. That's why one, one main recommendation is to definitely increase the n because then the number of microRNAs the adversary has to get access to scales with the, with the square of this value. Okay. Right. More questions? All right, let's thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.